I'd like to talk today about collective wisdom. I can talk a little bit about how collective wisdom is different than just wisdom, but um, I think um, growing in wisdom uh, is a topic that we can easily agree on that it's a good thing. I'll just jump right in. Uh, here's a passage about wisdom. Uh, wisdom is a wonderful thing. Proverbs 8, 8, all the words of my mouth are righteous. None of them are deceptive or perverse. All of them are clear to the perceptive and right to those who discover knowledge. Accept my instruction instead of silver and knowledge rather than pure gold. For wisdom is better than jewels and nothing desirable can compare with it. Do you want wisdom? I was a skilled craftsman before, beside him, speaking of God. I was his delight every day, always rejoicing before him. I was rejoicing in his inhabited world, delighting in the human race. And now, my sons, listen to me. Those who keep my ways are happy. Listen to instruction and be wise. Don't ignore it. Anyone who listens to me is happy watching at my doors every day, waiting the, by the posts of my doorways. For the one who finds me finds life and obtains favor from the Lord, but the one who misses me harms himself. All who hate me love death. Beautiful poetry about wisdom, and I took some extracts. I encourage you to read this chapter. I've read this over and over uh, it's just a beautiful, uh, it says wisdom was there when God created the world. Uh, wisdom was together with God. Uh, he said, who finds me finds life and obtains favor from the Lord. If you miss me, you harm yourself. Who, who, who hates me will love death. I think we all can agree we want to be wise. <laughs> I mean, who loves to be, you're, to be told they're foolish, right? It's just not, not, not encouraging. But wisdom is hard to find. We read in Job 28, and I, the, again, these are extracts from a, just a beautiful text about wisdom. It says, where then does wisdom come from? And where is understanding located? Is it, it is hidden from the eyes of every living thing, concealed from the birds of the sky. Abaddon and death say, we have heard news of it with our ears. But God understands the way of wisdom, and he knows its location, and he looks to the end of the earth and sees everything under the heavens. When God fixed the weight of the wind and limited the water by measure, when he established a limit for the rain and a path for the lightning, he considered wisdom and evaluated it. He had established it and examined it. He said to mankind, the fear of the Lord is wisdom, and to turn from evil is understanding. The fear of the Lord is wisdom. And so, but, but he, and this text says more about how hard wisdom is to find. And I think we recognize that wisdom is not easily acquired. Uh, I think it is one of those things that you get through pain, from, from, from failures, from, from things not going the way you thought they should, uh, and, and we acquire wisdom over time. And there's this simple statement that I think we, we struggle to completely understand, that the fear of the Lord is wisdom, and even learning the fear of the Lord is something we struggle with and, and learn over time. But I'd like to, to think about, okay, Wisdom is wonderful. It's hard to find. How are we doing on wisdom? And I think we have a very poor track record in, in the religious world. And Andy talked uh, some very similar things yesterday. Um, there was the Catholic tradition. Uh, you know, the world is full of polarized people and conflicts are everywhere. But sadly, Christianity is not doing significantly better, if not any better, than the world. 
you know, the Catholic tradition, Jesus said, it's a problem. Follow me and not your traditions. And so came the Protestant Reformation. And they said, sola scriptura, only the Bible. Then they had the five solas. Sola scriptura, sola Christos, sola fide, sola gracia, sola die de gloria, only God's glory. And then, well, maybe there's only three. They started arguing about how many solas. Where's the right number of solas? And, and so only scripture and Andy went through this a little bit, there are already conflicts right away about how do we interpret the scriptures. And so they said, ah, the Holy Spirit will guide us. The Holy Spirit will guide us into all truth. That's scripture. So they began to listen to the Holy Spirit. And... You get a room full of people thinking they're listening to the Holy Spirit, and you can get some serious noise, right? And they said, okay, the Holy Spirit teaches us things, but it didn't particularly unite us. How about logic? I mean, this was at the time of the Enlightenment, and Kant said you could build a moral system purely from rationality. So we just need to be rational. When we put together the scriptures, the spirit, and our logical minds, and we will be united. Thank you, the Enlightenment, for giving us rationality. And we see that, hmm, unity was not forthcoming. And then we had the restoration movement uh, that we talked a little bit about last night. And they had some really catchy stuff. No creed but God, no book but the Bible, no law but love, no name but the divine. In essentials, unity, in opinions, liberty, in all things, love. No creeds, remember. When the spirit spe scriptures speak, we speak. Where the spirit scriptures are silent, we are silent. Or Wait a minute, maybe, maybe it's the other way around. <laughs> so, I mean... This is embarrassing. And I think we, 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 as teachers, I think where is wisdom, where is unity going to come from? Uh, this is the place I would expect it to start. And I think we just need to look at our track record and, and say to ourselves, God is not the problem. The Bible is not the problem. The Holy Spirit is not the problem. What's the problem? It's us, right? It's just got to be us. The problem has got to be us. And we have just not built, we have not built unity. We have just not done it. Um, some of the ideas that I'm sharing with you today uh, were in a book by a, a, a Catholic theologian. Uh, his name is Bradley Gregory, and he called, his book is called The Unintended Reformation. And his claim that the Reformation is largely responsible for an atheistic world today. Because the, the, the world watched Christianity, and it's, they said, if they can't be more unified than that, why should I choose Christianity over what I see in the world? What's, what's better about Christianity? And I think that's a very humbling thing, but I think it should motivate us in a significant way to seek wisdom and to seek unity, uh, forged unity, uh, as we talked about. I think we need to ask our questions, how wise are we? I think, um, I'm, well, I, I don't think, I know I'm an elder uh, in the church in Paris, and I, people come to me seeking wisdom. And so I ask myself from time to time, how wise am I? And here's a good measure of wisdom in James. Who is wise and has understanding among you? He should show his works by good conduct and with wisdom's gentleness. If you have bitter envy, selfish ambition in your heart, don't brag and deny the truth. Such wisdom does not come from above, but is earthly, unspiritual, demonic. For, the, 
For where envy and selfish ambition exist, there is disorder in every kind of evil. But the wisdom from above is first pure, then peace-loving, gentle, compliant, full of mercy and good fruits, without favoritism and hypocrisy. And the fruit of righteousness is sown in peace by those who cultivate peace. And again, what a beautiful text. The wisdom from above. And I think the first question that I ask myself, does that describe me? Does that describe what I perceive is my wisdom? And does that describe then the wisdom that we're teaching one another, that we're learning from another? Are we growing more wise in the sense of being pure, peace-loving, gentle, compliant? Ooh, that compliant. <clears throat> Full of mercy and good fruits without favoritism and hypocrisy. I mean, those among us without hypocrisy stand up, you know? <laughs> it's, it is hard, you know, when, when you read uh, Job, Solomon knew it was hard. Wisdom is hard. And so I, th I think we can ask ourselves, is this the culture of our church leadership? Do we have a wise leadership? in our church, and this is one of the things we really work, work on. Uh, does our leadership work in a way that, that can be described uh, by this text? And I think I'd like to take a step back. Uh, we, we ended our list of opportunities for unity on rationality, on, on, on using our minds to, to, to work together. And this is a, is a globally, uh, David Hooper had that thing up in the upper quadrant, and that was the rational mind, and this room is full of people who believe themselves rational, and, and so much the better. But there's a problem with rationality. We have this picture of an elephant with a rider, and this is the favorite image of Jonathan Haidt, who says, we, our, our rational mind is the writer, and our emotions are the, the elephant. And everyone who's ridden on an elephant knows that if the elephant doesn't agree, it doesn't agree. <laughs> <laughs> and it just does what it wants to, and the writer can at very best stay on, right? <laughs> and, and so Jonathan, I, and we'll talk a little bit more about this, but he says, we decide with our hearts and we justify with our minds and our rationality. In uh, Alistair McIntyre, in Whose Justice, Whose Rationality, he, he, the whole book is about what is rationality. And in the end, the conclusion of the book, it does not exist. There is no such thing as a foundational rationality that everyone can agree on. We can't even agree on it. And he says that rational systems of of groups of people are so different that it's like the only way we can talk to each other about what rationality is, is becoming a native speaker in a different language. And he says, we're not talking about having a conversation and buying a coffee kind of literacy. He said, we're talking about knowing their jokes. And, and so he says, that when you live in one rational system, Understanding another is, is, is basically impossible. And so in the end, he says, if we're honest with ourselves, what is rationality? It's, well, whose rationality? Mine, right? If it's rational to me, it's rational. He said, that's the, basically the best we can do. And that's a, that's a humbling thing, but there's a lot of convincing evidence that it's true. Um, this is not new, David Hume, Scott, we have Scots among us. It wasn't a, a, a true believer in some ways at the end of his life, but he said, reason is and ought only to be the slave of the passions and can never to pretend to any other office than to serve and obey them. And basically what Jonathan Haidt did, he did a number of sociological research studies and to demonstrate that Hume was exactly right. And people hated this guy 
because Kant and all of his friends and rationality was the, the way forward. And Hume said, you're kidding yourselves. And the reality is that reason has not unified us. It just hasn't. And you read the, 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 the sociological literature, the philosophical literature, and they have done a pretty good job of proving that it never will. And I think we need to think hard about that because we argue with our rational minds. And, and that's one of the things Jonathan Haidt says, we, we have these rational arguments. And he said, in the end, two people are just hacked off at each other and they're having these rational arguments. And it's, it's like, you know, and, and nobody even hears anything. And uh, I'd like to look uh, quickly at, at an idea that I think is very, very useful uh, that I've been, been working with. Um, uh, this is a, a guy who wrote a book uh, recently. Uh, his name is Tim Urban. Uh, it's Why We Can't Get Along. And what he does, he says, he says what's our problem? A self-help book for societies. Uh, the higher mind, he says, is the, 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 this rational part. It, it's the superego, if you like, if you're a Freudian. Uh, the primitive mind is what Haidt, Haidt calls the elephant. Uh, the system one, the want self, the higher mind, the writer, the superego, system two, the should self. Plato called it a nice, nice image, the charioteer and the horses. And so we very often speak of ourselves on this horizontal scale. I'm a conservative, I'm a liberal, I'm a complementarian, I'm an egalitarian, I'm a histocritical biblicist, I'm a patternist, I'm a system, systematic theologian, I'm a yada, yada, yada. And we think about ourselves on this horizontal line. And, and we, we, we label each other on that horizontal line. But he says there's a very interesting vertical axis of our thinking that we need to think more carefully about. And he says up at the top, we're using our higher minds. He said down at the bottom, we're using our primitive minds. And he says, we need to think about this. If to think like a scientist is to be using that higher mind. So a scientist, at least a good one, seeks the truth. And the scientist presents his ideas to others who are capable of criticizing his ideas and says, what do you think? And they challenge his ideas and they reach a consensus, ah, okay, I was wrong. We need to change this. We need, to have, we need a new theory. And a science cares more about what is right than being right. That's a scientist's way of thinking. It doesn't mean all scientists think that way, but that's a scientist's way of thinking. Then there's a sports fan way of thinking. I'm in it with my team. If you're, you're at a football match, the referee makes a call, likely worth going to say it was a bad call. But in the end, we want the better team to win, right? We, we, we want, we want, we'd love for our team to win, but we want the better team to win. And in a sense, you could say we're open to persuasion, but we're pretty happy with our point of view. And then we step down one level lower, and we think like a lawyer. Now, a lawyer is a very interesting way of thinking because they don't give a flying flip if it's right or not. They're just defending a position. You know, uh, you can imagine you've got a murder in front of you and I'm the lawyer who defends this person. He doesn't even want to know if the person is guilty. He's just seeking ways to defend this particular person. And so a lawyer is a very interesting position because you may have an opinion, but you're defending, you're just defending a position. And I think sometimes we end up in the church, we may have never even thought, is this right or wrong? We just trained ourselves to defend a position. And I think as a young Christian, sometimes we defend a position without really having our own conviction about whether it's right or wrong. And then down at the bottom, the primitive mind is completely taken over and we have what we call a zealot. That's a little tricky because how many times have you been challenged to be zealous, right, as, as a Christian? But a zealot, fights for his position. And the zealot finds that there's the in camp and the out camp. Are you on my side or are you the enemy? Uh, Vines 
commentary of New Testament words, calls a zealous an uncompromising partisan. So we have these different ways of thinking and how I think it's really useful to think, where am I functioning on this vertical scale as a teacher? You know, there's a, I like this as another one of Tim Urban's uh, graphs. He says, teachers, we believe, have conviction and knowledge. But there's an arrogant zone, too much confidence, and there's an insecure zone, too much doubt. And then there's this happy humility sweet spot <laughs> where, where we're, we're balancing all these things out. And so I think it's really good to think, where am I on this graph? Uh, you know, insecurity and arrogance are not helpful, but they're very easy to, to have. And I think um, I had some, some recent personal struggles. I won't take a lot of time um, speaking about them, but um, we had some, some events in the church, um, some, a, a discipline event, and also an event with respect to, to the women's role. Uh, where uh, the choices that I made were, were perceived as being very unwise by certain people. Uh, one of the choices I made was perceived as unwise by my wife, and that's always hard. But uh, the, the, uh, and I began to feel like way down in the insecure zone. Am I, am I not wise at all, in fact? And, and I was really been struggling with this. Here's some good quotes uh, for, for the, I, I like this, real knowledge is known the extent of one's ignorance. I think that's a very good quote. And then I like, love this one from Albert Einstein, two things are infinite, the universe and human stupidity, and I'm not sure about the universe. <laughs> so okay, um, rationality is not gonna get us there. Um, wisdom is hard to obtain, but it's wonderful. Wait a minute. And I was sitting praying, and I remembered the scripture, and I said, wisdom is simple to acquire. James 1 says, now, if you, any of you lacks wisdom, he should ask God, who gives it to all generously and without criticizing. He doesn't say, you idiot, it's about time you ask. He just gives it. He gives it to him. Let, me, let him ask in faith without doubting, for the doubter is like the surging sea driven and tossed by the wind. The person should not expect to receive anything from the Lord. And I thought, okay, I, I, I can be wise, just have to ask God. And I said, doggone it, that verse about doubt is right after that. And I, I looked at it in my Bible and I said, no, it's, that's the context. The context is about asking for wisdom. It's not about something else. So I'm stuck with this thing. I have to ask for wisdom without doubting. And so I began to think about what, what? is practicing faith in asking for wisdom. What does that look like? Uh, I think we know some of these verses. Hebrews 5.14 talks about solid food is for mature. We've trained ourselves to determine between good and evil. We know that verse. Proverbs, uh, there's strength in a group. A wise warrior is better than, than, than a strong one. Wage war with sound guidance. Victory comes with many counselors. And so we know that in some sense, communicating with other people helps us in wisdom. And I think uh, I've been really, was really, really praying. I said, okay, God, I'm feeling really stupid. I'm not feeling wise. Uh, I've made some decisions that other people perceive as being very unwise. I'm not necessarily completely in agreement with them. I I'll just stop here. And that was my feeling. I went out and prayed for, for several hours. I just said, I'm just gonna stop here. Um, if after all these years, after being appointed to be an elder, after reading my Bible for over 40 years, if I can't be any more wise than that, I'll just stop. And then I, my wife says, aren't, aren't you exaggerating a little bit? <laughs> but I, I just kept coming back to this passage. Um, and, and you know, I think about this. I prayed for wisdom. I'm gonna do it without doubting. God gave it to me, so when I speak to others, I'm right, because I asked God for wisdom, and he gave it to me. And then I, oh, but they prayed for wisdom. They had, did it with faith, and they believed they're right. 
And so we have two people that have asked for wisdom. God gave it to them, and they don't agree. And I think we, we just find this so many times in, in our Christian experience. We have two people that don't agree, uh, and, and they are convinced that God gave them wisdom. And I think one of the, the key things that I see about this is that we have to believe that we can find it. And I think one of the things that is the most helpful in finding wisdom, and Andy talked, uh, talked about this a little bit, Andy Bocci talked about this a little bit yesterday, we need to listen attentively to people that disagree with us. And that's really, really hard. And entertain the possibility that I am wrong. And I think leadership groups are the place where we can think like scientists, where we have people that can challenge our ideas and know what they're thinking about. And in, in Tim Burton's book, he talks about people that, that like their idea, and so they ask for challenges from you know, their, their children or, or uh, somebody that knows nothing about the topic. Do you think I'm right? Well, I don't know. Okay, I'm, I've, I asked for advice, so. And I, I think we, we can tend to be that way sometimes, but I think in a leadership group where we're peers, it's the place we really, really have to listen. And I think it, it, faith says we have to be courageous with what we believe. I do believe God gave me this wisdom and I'm going to share it with you. And even if you disagree with me, I'm, I'm going to hold my conviction until I'm convinced. And I think this is very, very hard. This is, this is a hard fought battle. But I think it's so important. And I think it's how we grow in maturity and collective wisdom when we disagree in a healthy fashion, when we think like scientists about the problem of, of the churches and not zealots. So I hope that was useful. There's a few of the books uh, that I mentioned, uh, and I'll give Otto the floor to continue talking about the, the, some of the practicals of collective wisdom. Once again, we have some technical stuff. No, oh, it's the other way. Eh? No, yeah. Yeah, thank you, Brad. I mean, this light blue humility line, it was something very challenging. Well, to me at least. Um, let me just. Yeah, great. Um, let me start maybe with a personal note uh, about Matti. <laughs> no, no, not really. But uh, when, when Matti called me and asked me to share it with you, uh, I feel honored and inspired. But immediately, I was thinking on a one specific passage in Acts 19. Maybe we can read it together. <laughs> Some Jews who went around driving out evil spirits tried to invoke the name of the Lord Jesus or those who were demon-possessed. They would say, in the name of Jesus who Paul preached, I command you to come out. Seven sons of Sceva, a Jewish chief priest, were doing this. And one day the evil spirit answered them, Jesus I know and Paul I know about, but who are you? <laughs> Well, then the man who had the evil spirit jumped on them and overpowered them all. He gave them such a beating that they ran out of the house naked and bleeding. Well, yeah, <laughs> thank you. Re reflecting on the passage, I found him very resonating with me. You might be thinking, you know, Andy Fleming, I know. <laughs> and I know David Hoover. <laughs> But who are you? <laughs> uh, however, I realized uh, that me supplying the scriptures in this context would, wouldn't be appropriate. I mean, I were uh, to associate David Hooper with Paul and uh, Andy Fleming with G. Uh, well, you, you got the point. <laughs> Even worse, I wouldn't imply that I'm associating you, my brothers and sisters, with an evil spirit. 
<laughs> That's certainly not true. <laughs> so thank you, Helena, for introducing me, you know? <laughs> Running naked is not my thing. <laughs> okay. Uh, but uh, I want to actually introduce to you my team. Uh, it's the best team I'm being part of. Uh, yeah, I, I don't know who is in charge, you know, for distributing angels between people, but I got three of them. It's statistically more than average per capita, I believe. <laughs> Very thankful to those three women you see around me. But then I wanted to introduce to you also our leadership team in Riga Church and our sheep shepherd team. Uh, First, let's meet Zhenya. She, uh, she radiates warm and uh, care, and she has multiple, like, incredible stories. Uh, she refers to them as miracles. Uh, these stories span uh, uh, from 30 years ago, when she was baptized in Kiev, to more recent times. If we are in need of some inspirational account, you know, showcasing the power of God, she's the person to turn on. Next, uh, Iveta. She's a wise woman who is thriving uh, in IT field. She possessed remarkable out-of-the-box thinking and very community-oriented. So her unique insights uh, are, are highly valued uh, within our team. Then um, there is Adriana. Despite, despite her young age, she possesses a deep wisdom that garners respect. Having grown up in churches across Moldova and Ukraine and Latvia, she brings a diverse perspective. She dedicates herself to impactful work with students, making her an invaluable resource for understanding the mind of a young people. I mean, uh, I was thinking when, when, when Brad was speaking, uh, I just realizing he started to, to learn the Bible before I even was born, you know? <laughs> and like, uh, well, he walked with God before I walked. <laughs> I mean, <laughs> but um, it doesn't make me uh, next generation, I believe. This is an, our next generation. And then allowed me to introduce you my wife, Helena. She's truly inspirational and emotional, as you all have seen. Uh, and she serves an excellent partner to me uh, in Bible studies, and also actually an excellent partner in Bible study to others. Uh, she has very strong convictions, and she has, you know, this real hot spot, a passion, a passion for God and his people. Uh, I love you very much. Uh, then, um, meet Sandu. He's a multi-talented individual with strength in leadership and strategic thinking. And he also provides practical teaching on family relationship, child raising. He excels in offering very visible, you know, real world examples, making uh, his guidance in this area, like, invaluable for us. Geertz. A prosperous businessman possesses a profound understanding of finances, but also like a biblical approach to the money. Mm, he delves into various other subjects, such as the role of father and evangelism and transgenerational ties. Notably, both his mom and his son got baptized, so he has some experience, you know, in multi-generational stuff. <laughs> okay. And as you noticed, Adrian, a skilled worship leader, who imparts spiritual insight into the meaning of worship. His uh, leadership abilities and examples are greatly respected uh, by our students. You know, they, they have some reverence for gray hairs, but uh, Adrian actually is the one who connects with them and he can reach their minds and their hearts. So thank you, Adrian, for doing that. Like, it's, it's, um, it's amazing what you shared today also. Here is uh, Yuris and Marina. They are shepherds for a kid's kingdom. 
Uh, they oversee programs spanning all age groups, and they're always ready to provide a guidance and inspiration why you have to serve children. <laughs> it's uh, actually an important stuff because, well, they worked with the youth. Adrian is now baptizing them. Yeah. Like, that's how it works. Yeah. And finally, uh, Janis and Mare, yeah. our young shepherds, they exemplify how to serve God's people by raising three small children on their own, you know. They care giving and the inspirational teaching and uh, the dedication to learning from the Bible is a truly commendable thing. So that's the team or collective wisdom if you want to. <clears throat> now let me share some short notices regarding a teaching with group wisdom. Uh, in Acts 18, we can read about the Corinthian church. I love this idea. Once upon a time, Paul taught in a synagogue. <laughs> but due to the disagreement, he, he decided to turn to pagans. Yeah? From now on, I'm going to Gentiles. Well, not far he went. He actually re relocated to the next house. Uh, I mean, what kind of pagan would live near the synagogue? But that's another topic. <laughs> uh, but he continued his teaching, and eventually an altercation occurred, and Paul was brought before the proconsul Galilean for accusation. It proved to be unsuccessful. Paul was released, but however, the angry mob beat the leader of the synagogue, Sostenes, instead. And interestingly, in 1 Corinthians 1.1, 1, 1, uh, Sostenes is mentioned as co-author. Potentially, it's the same person. Uh, I mean, like we are saying, like Paul's letter, like but Paul himself wrote, he has a co-author, Sustine is there, and it's a, not the first letter to Corinth anyway, uh, so sometimes uh, some names can be misleading, but it's remarkable that Sustine is uh, become a partner for Paul after such events, Qu quite a transformation, I believe. But then I was thinking about uh, what does it mean a synagogue leader, like director of a synagogue? What, what is the task of a director of a synagogue? And according to uh, James Freeman, uh, the responsibilities encompass organizing worship, maintaining order, and overseeing the upkeep of the building. So these uh, areas have to be sustained experience, right? Uh, we can only speculate why Paul included Sostinus as a co-author of the letter. One possibility would be that Sostinus was well known to some members of the church, uh, still maybe carrying some authority. But at all, not uh, certain sections of the letter may be influenced by Sostinus experience. For example, let's think about 1 Corinthians 14, orderly speaking and translating. Uh, or matters like orderly conduct of women, uh, you know, uh, women's dress, or the Lord's Supper. It seems that there is some connection. Maybe Paul was actually using the collective wisdom, Sostine's wisdom. Or um, let's explore another story, Romans 16, 1 to 2. Uh, well, uh, Romans didn't mention a co-author, but we have a beautiful chapter 16 where all the you know, greetings are. Uh, we have uh, to dig a bit in, but we, we, we can have a valuable insights after that. So uh, here we are reading about Phoebe, uh, a deacon, a servant yeah, in a church of uh, Kenchaia, a port near Corinth. And it's believed that she delivered Paul's letter uh, to the church in Rome. But who, who was Phoebe? It's suggested that she might be a new Roman woman, uh, you know, uh, this term described by mm, Bruce Winter, successful businesswoman. Uh, maybe her dealings, you know, business dealing, uh, uh, dealings uh, brought her on a trip to Rome, offering the opportunity to bring the letter with her. Uh, she was probably uh, financially independent, actively involved in social life. Um, might be that uh, she was more than just a letter carrier. I mean, 
in custom of the time, it's plausible that she read the letter aloud and provided commentary when necessary. Furthermore, uh, Edit Dean uh, highlights the use of the term prostatis or benefactor uh, in Romans 16.2. The word carries the connotation of protecting the weak, shielding the people from suffering, uh, caring for the oppressed. Considering this, could it be that Paul discussed certain parts of the letter, particularly those who speak about the weak, for example, first verses in Romans 15, with Phoebe? Once again, we could see the importance of seeking wisdom of others engaging in a group discussions, maybe enhance understanding, broaden your perspective on things. Uh, towards the end of the Roman, we come across some greetings uh, from Paul's companion. In verse 21, we encounter the well-known figure Timothy, along with uh, Lucius and Jason and uh, Sosipatras. Personally, I love verse 22, uh, where Tertius, the uh, amanuensis of Paul, wrote his own greeting. Uh, it reminds me of a past experience with Sandu, uh, whose uh, English was not as proficient back then. Uh, well, neither was mine. But uh, sometimes he also help uh, in writing emails in English. And I had a temptation, you know, to include a line like, I, Otto, who wrote this letter, <laughs> greet you in the Lord. <laughs> I have a confession to make. I did it. <laughs> and not once. <laughs> but on a more serious note, I mean, Sandu and I collaborate on writing letters even now. We are discussing and refining sentences, but as well, we are shaping our thinking process. You know, we, we, we are together discussing maybe direction or ideas or, or, or well, every important matter. And uh, moving on to verse uh, 33, uh, here is Erastus, uh, the city director of public works, a uh, position of high standing and also has uh, a deal. So what would be Erastus' uh, usual duties? Uh, as noted by uh, David Gill, uh, ideals were responsible for overseeing the maintenance of public building like aqueducts and marketplaces. They also manage revenues from these places, including taxes, and served as judges, uh, presiding over uh, some legal cases and even enforcing public order. Could it be that actually Erastus played a significant role in shaping certain parts of a Paul's letter? I mean, for example, Romans 13, discussing taxes and governing authorities, you know, as God's servants for community good. I mean, aqueducts they are. <laughs> so might it be that it, it was born actually out of discussions with, with Erastus? Even uh, Romans 14 uh, that deals with, uh, you know, matters of judgment could be influenced by, by Erastus' expertise in this area. Of course, maybe we can be certain, uh, you know, about the specifics of the situation. However, could it be that the exchange of ideas and experience between Paul and his companions contributed to the profound teaching found in his letters? And maybe God is also helping us understand the value of collaborational teaching and, well, learning. And that's my second point, learning from a group wisdom. We can learn from the wisdom of a group. And let me introduce to you a concept of a havrusa or havruta. Uh, it involves learning in a group setting where the Bible text is read, ideas are discussed, examined, and critiqued collaboratively to foster a process of discovery. Learning in a group of disciples emphasizes constructing ideas, fostering working relationships, recognizing how these processes influence each other. The success of Havruta uh, lies in uh, interdependence, meaningful interaction between people and between people and the text. And um, Jacob Neusner notes, from the first century AD forward, Jews formed that kind of fellowship to study Bible together. They shared concerns and goals, they established some principles, and taught those principles to the broader community. Uh, 
Fellowship is defined by Noisner's follows. Fellowship may be defined as a relationship among individuals characterized by reciprocity of profound concerns from one another and dedication to a goal held in common. In such a relationship, individuals respect one another's integrity, individuality, and uniqueness, thus remaining autonomous, but at the same time submit to a purpose of the self-imposed, socially relevant discipline. In a true fellowship, individuals submit their persons to a group. A fellowship involves the individual immediately and directly in the purpose of the group. Yet the individual may find in such a group a means of achieving greater individual individuality by his own efforts to serve a common goal. And mutual respect and affection may develop out of such shared concerns, but a fellowship, unlike a clique, does not depend on congeniality. A Jewish fellowship rests upon the huge belief that when Ten Jews assembles for sacred purposes, the presence of God is among them. A Jewish fellowship represents the effort to constitute a group worthy of the presence of God. Uh, as you can see, each individual in the group brings their strength and their perspectives, challenging one another with fresh outlook and different approaches. And this ensures that we stay connected with others. You know, we have this reality check. We have this sense of what is good for community, not, you know, from my point of view only. And most importantly, strive to please God rather than ourselves. And um, I was thinking about Act 17, you know, with Berean's approach to a learning as a group. Uh, I mean, uh, David yesterday um, had this... Uh, wonderful thoughts of you, which is not individual, but collective. I mean, Bereans, it's a plural. It's not like they were going home and study their Bibles. They done it together, right? Similarly, Paul's practice of traveling and teaching and writing letters in a group could be attributed to the desire to learn from the group collective wisdom. Collaboration, mutual learning, and reach the understanding and application of God's teaching, I believe. Well, as I say, it takes a village to raise a child. Likewise, it shouldn't take any less to raise a mature disciple or a mature church. We ourselves and also our churches are in need of multitude of diverse influences. Like the guidance of Sustinus and Phoebus and Erastus to foster our maturity. Community learning plays a crucial role in this process, I believe. And uh, Paul himself acknowledged the importance of a diverse group of people who can positively influence the church. I mean, Andy Fleming yesterday showed us uh, Ephesians 4, and think about it. Apostles and prophets and evangelists and pastors and teachers. Isn't that a div diverse group, actually? Like different influences to become mature. And also, an active involvement of uh, various members, which each, uh, well, with each part fulfilling unique role, Right? So as we draw upon the collective insights, experience, contributions of diverse individuals within community, we, I believe, enrich understanding of spiritual matters and deepen our growth as disciples and as a church. Embracing group wisdom, teaching with it, learning from it, in my opinion, it's one of the keys to individual and congregational maturity. Thank you, and now I know the questions and answers. So, yeah, we turn to the question and answer session. We have about uh, seven minutes, um, but thank you very much, uh, Brad and uh, Otto, for bringing out, I mean, the importance of for sure, uh, understand having wisdom, especially biblical wisdom, um, but uh, especially collective wisdom. 
Uh, and I think we need all to be reminded of, of this important topic, especially our individualistic uh, mindset, uh, what we have. Um, and, uh, but I think one thing was not so great, uh, Brett, uh, that you debunked many of us uh, not to be rational. Um, <laughs> and I, I hope my wife was not uh, watching uh, online uh, right now. But, uh, so we have two microphones. Uh, please be short and clear so that uh, many can ask questions uh, here. Yeah. Yeah, thank you very much, uh, Brad and Otto. Um, my name is Sam from Switzerland. My first question would be, what is wisdom? Do you have a definition? The definition is the fear of God. The fear of God. That, that's, that's a little bit cheeky, but, but uh, that's, that's what uh, it says in Proverbs. It's the fear of God. I think um, wisdom, in, in a sense, is having God's perspective on, on, on life uh, and the universe and everything, to quote a famous author. But it's, it's having God's perspective uh, on, on things, on right and wrong, uh, on, on, on the matters of, of, of the world is having God's perspective. And I think that's when, when the proverb says, fear God is wisdom, it, it's to, to honor and respect God and imitate him. And that would be my short definition. Uh, very quickly, thank you so much, uh, particularly uh, for the Riga Church. What you guys are doing is something uh, that we would love to emulate in our small church in Edinburgh that taking many groups of diverse people with different skill sets, mm -hmm. I'd love to pick your brains. And, and how, how, how has it gone, the mechanics of working within this leadership structure for you, I mean, the practicals of getting it together? Well, that's another two hours. <laughs> <laughs> but I mean, uh, we, are, we are trying to, to communicate between one another like all the time, like, like choosing different topics, whatever is needed, you know, like maybe we should speak about that, who could speak about that, you know, like, oh, probably Geertz should speak about that because, you know, he has some insights and talents and like everybody, hey, Geertz, go, 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 you know, it's your turn now. Or we have one uh, speaker who normally speaks uh, on, a, on a celebration occasions. Like, uh, he's just such an inspirational person. Like, everybody wants to hear him if it's, you know, if it's a festivity. So, something like that. It's go all the time, like, a lot of communication. And, I mean, like, that's collective, you know? That's what collective means, all right? Maybe on their side, somebody. Never will get. All clear. Hi, everyone. I'm Liesl, and I'm from the UK. Um, I have actually two questions. Could we have the slide on the wisdom books up again? Is that possible? Or later, maybe? And then also my second question is just around, you know, when two individuals that are both believing that they have prayed and they've got the wisdom from God, and there's a process of trying to, um, you know, figure that out, is there a point where you say, we both believe we are right, we have asked God, we agree to disagree and continue peacefully? Or what would you say would be a typical outcome of, of that process? Um, that is a um, very challenging question, and I think we... Uh, we... There isn't an easy answer to it. Uh, I think uh, continuing to pray, continuing to pray is important. Um, I, think, um, I think just dialing down, one of my big, the biggest things I would say, dial down your assurance uh, about the position that you hold. The, the, the slide is up, if we can have it up there. The, dial down your assurance. Uh, my wife and I uh, think very differently about so many things, and one of the things we learned early in our marriage is the more sure I am about something, the less likely I am to be right. And I think that's been very, very useful for us, but I think that corresponds very well to this vertical thing. When we become a zealot 
about what we believe, um, we no longer think wisely and rationally and thoughtfully. And I think, I think um, that's one of the things that's helped us in the leadership. And I think what, the other piece of it uh, in, in the Paris eldership that we've had to really work on is caring more about unity than being right. And I think, I think uh, that sound, that's kind of a easy sounding phrase, but I think it's extremely difficult. Uh, caring more about being unified and being right. And I, uh, I think sometimes, you know, sometimes I pray, I, I still think I'm right. If this turns out well, amen. If this turns out po poorly, God help me. Um, you know, Scheinfreud is not a good place to go, so. Being, being, you know, take, going, I told you so, right? There is a question. I'm asking this time. Um, thank you both for excellent, excellent uh, thought-provoking discussions. And in light of what you were just saying, I know there's been a few veiled references to Brexit in this. And, um, and, and being English and having to live through that experience has been a really challenging experience. And what does unity even look like in the UK now, you know, as a result of that particular sort of dichotomy and polarized opinions and polarization? And I guess whenever you've got polarization, then you've got a question. And maybe you just need to rip up the dichotomy and just start again because, uh, yeah. So, and we still don't have any answers, right, to that particular um, situation at all. Um, but the question I wanted to ask is probably for everybody is, are all the slides going to be available for all the talks? Is there any? Because it would be great if we could get all the slides because so much came up today. I didn't have time to, couldn't write the notes. I can commit that mine can be. Um, I think. I think. I think Andy already did that as well. Uh, Andy Bwachi. Uh There was so much of his that was in his voice that I'm not sure that even comes out in a slide. But, but I, I, I would say globally, yes. And so mostly it's just Bible anyway. <laughs> the, 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 the video. The videos are online as well. But um, I, and, and just about the, the the dichotomy thing, I would just share one one thought from Paris. I think one of the things that helped us the most when we were just not, not able to move forward was, was vulnerability. It was saying, I feel this way about you uh, and not I feel this way. You know, we, we have to take it down. I, I, that's, I think that's what's written in this Righteous Mind and What's Our Problem book. We, we, we want to think, we're think we're being rational, but we're not. And so the discussion has to happen at the heart level, not about some theological position we think we hold. And, and I, I think that's the, the hardest thing that we have to do is to take the discussion from the, the safe theological topic to the very vulnerable, uh, I don't like your hair kind of thing, you know. Do I feel listened to? Exactly. Do I feel, do I feel heard? Do I feel listened to? Do I feel heard? Do I feel respected? Uh, do I feel like you're, you're being unfair to me? Those kinds of things. So thank you. We are, time is up, uh, but uh, there are, uh, break, there's a break now uh, for four, 15 minutes. Uh, so uh, as Mati says, uh, sharp 11, we will uh, start again here. But thanks once more, uh, Brett and uh, Otto.